My name is Nikki. Oh, there we go. You got the recording pop up there. Um, my name is Nikki Beitman. I am a biomedical engineer by background. I actually am originally from Cleveland, Ohio. I went to the University of Akron and graduated there. And then I've lived in St. Louis, and then now I live down in Charleston, South Carolina. So I've been doing 3D printing in the healthcare field for this is my going on my sixth year now. So it's an ever growing technology. There's new things constantly coming out. So this presentation, I'm going to go through really the basics of 3D printing. What is 3D printing? How do you do it? How do you design things to be 3D printed? And then I'm going to talk about how we apply those things in the healthcare field and go into some of the regulations that need to be followed along the way. So like she said, um, oh, hello from Cleveland Clinic. Yes, my hometown there. So I am watching the chat box. If you guys pop stuff in there, I will try to answer it as I go. Um, but if I miss something, I'll try to catch up with everyone at the end as well. I have a couple videos in here. So um, I'm going to be switching between screens a couple times. I've also been battling a cold for a week. So if I pause for a second, I'm just drinking some water. Don't mind me. I will be right back. All right. With that, let's go ahead and get started. So additive manufacturing, it's a very fancy word for 3D printing. So what exactly is it? When we talk about doing additive manufacturing, we're adding layers together on top of each other to build our end product that we've designed. So this is a quick little video. This printing is actually a style called FDM, which is filament deposition modeling. And I'm, I'll go into more details on that in a couple slides, but let me just run this real quick so you can see it layering on top of each other. So what's going on in this video is there's a spool of filament that is threaded into this head. This head is heating it and it's melting it through this nozzle and building layer by layer based on the design file that you uploaded to the printer. So the opposite thing of additive manufacturing would be subtractive processes. So something like CNC, where you would take a large piece of material um, as shown on the right hand side and subtract out what you want to make your end product. So of course, the difference between adding something or subtracting something, you have waste when you're subtracting because you have to start with more than what you need and remove what you don't. But from adding, doing the additive manufacturing, you have no waste. You are only using the material that's required for your end part. So this is an example of kind of how we would implement this. So initially, of course, you brainstorm an idea. So someone will come to us and say, you know, hey, I, I need this, either if it's something specific for a patient or if it's just like, a, hey, this piece broke off of this piece of equipment that I have and I just want to replace this piece. Can you literally copy this piece that I have? And then from there, you go into your design stage. So when you're designing, you're using 3D CAD. So um, there's hundreds of different CAD softwares out there that you can design files into to then upload to your printer later. After you design it, you'll evaluate it. So we always go back to the requester that asked for the product and we show them the design and make sure they're okay with it. Then from there, we prep it for printing, which involves slicing it, which I'm gonna talk about. From slicing, you'll upload it to the printer and you're gonna get your first prototype. Then of course, from your prototype, you're gonna test it. And we have this theme that we always tell anyone, anytime I 3D print something, I ask them to break it. 
And they always look at me like I'm absolutely crazy that I asked that, but we are dead serious. We want people to try to break it because if they can break it, then it's not good enough. So if the product is the break, we can either try using a different material. We can try to design it differently. There's a lot of different changes you can make. So you'll viciously go through that prototype test, prototype test until you come up with your final product and then you can go into production. So if you can imagine, this can sometimes get very time consuming. I can tell you there is one product that we've been working on. I think we're on version 22. So sometimes there's many, many prototypes before you get to your final end product. So let's talk about CAD a little bit. So CAD stands for Computer Aided Design. One of the biggest things we find in the 3D printing field is there's plenty of people that know how to run a 3D printer. It's honestly not that complicated to actually run the printer. The complicated part is doing the design work to build the things that you want to be printed. So um, for those who haven't really seen too much CAD, I'm going to show an example in a second, but basically you're just building from scratch into three-dimensional shapes to create a product. So we, there's different types of CADs out there. There's product-specific CADs. So in a little bit, I'm going to show you some dental CAD work. So there's CAD softwares designed specifically to make dental applications. So they have workflows built into the software that if you say, oh, I want to make a night guard, it'll just walk you through the CAD of a night guard. Or there's the anatomical modeling CAD, um, again, with built-in workflows. But for this one, I'm going to show you a little bit of if I want to design something completely from scratch, what kind of softwares are out there. So these would be any kind of open source softwares. Um, these two are both totally free. So on ShapeCAD and also Tinkercad. Um, Tinkercad is very basic. I'm going to show you guys uh, examples of them. Um, a very common one that is used in many colleges is SolidWorks, if that name rings a bell, um, or AutoCAD. Those are two very well-known big companies um, that have a lot of reputations in universities and a lot of educational settings. So let me pop open real quick um, on shape and show you guys an example in there. I will also show you Tinkercad. So the example I'm going to show, this is the item. Let me drag this over so you guys can see real quick. Okay, so this was the item someone came to us and said, hey, we're having problems with our specimen tubes either getting knocked over or the holder that they had wasn't very stable. So then they were having to re-swab people because the sample got ruined. So they found this one online. They said they really liked this. Um, and they sent me this picture and they said, is this something that you can duplicate with a 3D printer? And luckily on this site, they actually have dimensions on here. So we know exactly how big um, these holes are on this product. So what I did is over here in my on shape, I went from scratch. I'm going to back this up. So when you have all your um, screens on here, you have a front, the right, and then the top. So if you're looking at something in three dimensions, you have different planes within how you're viewing that product. So what I did was, okay, I'm just gonna draw this on the front and here was my initial sketch. So I went through and you just go, you have all these different fields across the top here where you can do lines, squares, circles, however you wanna sketch it out. So I just made a very basic sketch and I'm gonna hide the other two planes so it's not super confusing to look at. So here's a flat plane surface. So nothing is in 3D. It's just a basic sketch that's laying down on this plane. So from there, once I have everything dimensioned, I know how big I wanted it to be. I rounded off the edges to make it a little more aesthetically pleasing instead of having a rough 90 degree angle there. So then from there, I use a feature that's called extruding. So when you extrude, you can then figure out your dimension. So this is where you go into 3D. So you always start with your basic, basic shape of what on a flat plane, and then you pop it out into 3D. 
once you get into 3D, then you can go ahead and start manipulating if you want to add another plane here and then build off into this direction. You basically are constantly just adding planes and surfaces and building out into a 3D image. So for this product, I, this was very easy. It's a very basic U shape, and then you just had to extrude out. Then I need to put my holes in it. So I just started another sketch and I drew using the circle function, I just drew my holes onto this flat surface here. And then again, with the extrude feature again, where you see here, instead of adding this time, I hit remove and then I extruded through that surface to make holes. So as you can see, I now have the holes in the places and that was literally it. Now I have my M product. So I, you know, drew this in probably less than five minutes when I initially did it. Um, from the software down here, you would just go to export. And what you're exporting out of CAD is actually your STL file. And I'll talk about that a little more in a bit, but um, your STL file is what you will then go and upload to the printer. So like I said, this one is called Onshape. It's totally free. So anyone can go on here and create an account with your own email address. They do have, um, you can do a paid license with them. If you do a paid license, it makes your account private. Um, otherwise, you can just make a public account. Um, if your account is public, if someone, they have a search bar over here, if you're on public, and you can search for files. So you can see what anyone has made. They have this really nice learning center that you can click on in here. I also um, meant to put a disclaimer on this presentation. I am in no way, shape or form affiliated with any of these companies that I'm talking about. These are just some well-known free ones that I wanted to highlight for anyone who's getting started so you kind of know where to go. So, but from their learning center, um, they have these self-paced courses and these again are all totally free. So you can go through the instructor led ones you have to pay for, but the self-paced ones, they'll walk you step-by-step step through how to do CAD. So it's like CAD basics, introduction to part design, all these things. So you can totally learn CAD for free by yourself online to get started. So it's a great benefit. Um, and the other one I was showing is Tinkercad. So Tinkercad is actually really great. I did a presentation at my daughter's school. She's three. Um, so I did a 3D printing presentation for a bunch of little kids. And we did, um, we talked about Tinkercad and we did a, a write up for people, for the kids' parents, because Tinkercad really is basic in the sense that it gives you these already done shapes over here. So you can select, you know, okay, I want, I want this cylinder. So I'm going to bring it over here. And then, well, I want it to be a little tall or I want to lift it up. And then if you wanna make it taller, you can do this. Um, so you can bring all these different already made designs in and kind of build. So then if you're looking from the top and you're like, well, I wanna move this on top of this and you can kind of build out different things. Um, so that's the nice thing about Tinkercad is it's, it's pre-structured for you. Um, if you click here, there's the basic shapes, design starters. They have, you know, little characters already in here. So it's fun to make different designs in here without really going from scratch. So you can kind of build things together and create different products. So that's Tinkercad. Then back over to my presentation here. So, okay, we talked about CAD, we talked about getting your design file. So now what do you do with it? So you go into something called your slicer software. So slicing software is where you get all the details of how your design is actually going to print on the printer. So for example, if you're using an FDM printer, like I showed in my first slide that does the filament, you're gonna wanna adjust the temperature for the hot end and also the temperature of the print bed based on the different materials that you're using. So for some examples of plastic, there's PLA or PETG. So the melting point of PLA is 185 degrees C compared to PETG's 
like between 222 30 degrees C. So you have to put that into your slicing software and tell the printer, okay, this is the material that I'm using. I need it to heat up to this temperature to melt that material for it to be able to build your product for you. So that's all in your slicer. Then you also will be putting in here your layer height. So as you can see, like on this example, these different layers on here, the thicker your layer, the bumpier your part is gonna be. If you do really thin, thin layers, you're gonna have a long print because it's gonna take it a long time to make all those extra thin layers, but your print is gonna be perfectly smooth. So you won't really have to sand anything or do too much post-processing afterwards. You're, you'll also set your infill. So if you want something to be absolutely solid or if you want it to be a little more hollow on the inside. So as you can see in this picture, the infill is a hexagon shape. You can also pick a triangular shape, a square shape, um, however you want the infill to go. This all dictates the strength of your product. So if I'm making a prototype and I'm literally just trying to print it to see if it's going to work, I don't really care how strong it is. I'm going to do a very low infill because I just want it to print really fast and I just want to see what the design looks like. But then maybe as I finalize my design, I'll bump my infill up and make it a lot more solid. So then my product's a lot harder and it could take, you know, more of a beating if it needed to. You'll also dictate the speed of your prints in this. Um, your speed is determined based on the material, the temperature, your nozzle size, and also your design. So if you have, it's kind of opposite what you would think. If you have a very big nozzle, you actually have to go slow because it takes more time to melt that um, filament going through it. So you don't want filament just like pouring out everywhere. You need to let it um, melt the thicker material going through. So let's see what else in slicers. Um, in your slicer, you'll add support structures. So if your final product has like an overhang on it, you have to put supports on it. So the printer can build up um, and support the overhang. And then when your print's done, you'll break off those supports if you need to. So lastly, what it shows you in the slicer is in the this upper left-hand corner, you have your build time, um, your filament length, weight, and the material cost. So it'll tell you, okay, you use this much material based on like your spool size, it's going to cost you 48 cents to make this. And then you also can tell how long it's going to take to actually print. So most proprietary printers also have a proprietary slicer that goes along with their printer. There's pros and cons to this. The pro is that slicer is going to, if it's proprietary within a proprietary printer, that slicer is so specific, you don't really have as many options of things to pick. It's just going to do what it needs to do to give you the correct product based on the printer you're using. But the con of that is you're limited on changes. So the nice thing about doing an open source slicer is you can make every single little detail change that you possibly want in there and get it exactly how you want to. So again, pros and cons to both. Sometimes it's nice to be limited because you don't have so many options to choose from and you still get a really good print. But sometimes you're like, oh, I wish I could just change this one little thing about it. So um, there's a lot of open source slicing softwares, again, that you can download for free. Um, Prusa Slicer is a very common one that's very popular. Um, I don't have it on my slide. So actually let me just um, pull it up real quick so I can drop it in the chat for you guys. So let's see. Um, here, I'll type it. So Prusa Slicer and then there's also Cura Slicer. Those two are both very common free slicers that anyone can download and use. All right, so types of printers. So um, like I talked about, the first slide was at FDM, the fused deposition modeling. Um, the second most common one is VAT photopolymerization. So this is the process in which a UV light is reacting with resin in a liquid tray to form a part. So 
there's three different types. Um, honestly, there's probably more, but the three common ones, um, SLA is stereolithography, um, DLP is digital light processing, and CDLM is continuous digital light manufacturing. As you just heard me say, they all have something to do with digital light in some way interacting with the resin. So let me show, pull this back over real quick. I'm just gonna show a little clip of each example here. So this will give you a little breakdown on just SLA printing. To produce parts, vat polarization follows four main steps. Firstly, the build plate is positioned inside a tank of photopolymer resin. The build platform is positioned so that a very thin layer of resin covers the surface. A UV light source then scans the first layer of the part. Because photopolymers are sensitive to ultraviolet light, the resin is photochemically solidified. With vat polymerization technology, the average layer height is about 100 microns, but they can go as low as 25 microns, much smaller than FDM. When a so as you can see, you have your the liquid bed here and you saw the lights flashing. So that light is curing that resin in the shape of the file that you uploaded it to. Then next on the list is material jetting. So this is also called polyjet printing. Um, the, the polyjet printers are very expensive. Um, they're mostly large scale. I've never seen a mini polyjet printer. I've never seen a desktop size polyjet printer. They're mostly all large. Um, really the difference between polyjet and VAT photopolymerization, um, for the VAT, you then have to post-process that product. So you saw how it was hanging there over the liquid resin and it's still all wet. There's resin dripping off of it. So you'll take it off the printer. You need to wash it typically in isopropyl alcohol, sometimes ethanol. And then you have to put it in a cure box to let it actually fully harden. Whereas the difference with a polyjet is, I'll show you this video, and they'll talk about this a little bit, but when you're printing off of this side, there's um, cure lights built into this. So it's curing as it goes. So you don't have the post-processing steps where you need to wash it and cure it after. So let me just let this run for a second. Similar to how an inkjet printer lays down pigment, the Polyjet Printhead deposits small amounts of ultraviolet curable material on the build platform, eventually forming a single cross-section of the part. An ultraviolet light attached to the printhead simultaneously cures the material as it is printed. Once a cross-section is complete, the build platform is lowered slightly to make room for the next layer. As the part is built, support material is added to give supplemental strength to fine structures and down-facing surfaces. After all of the layers have been created, the finished part is removed from the platform and cleaned. All right, so you saw a little bit how that one works. So powder bed fusion and binder jetting. Um, I'll show two different videos, but they're pretty similar with the exception of powder bed fusion selective laser sintering, also known as SLS, uses a laser to um, adhere the powder together. So I'll show you a quick video, but basically you're going to have a roller that's going to lay out a layer of powder. You're going to have a laser that then um, cures that powder together. The print bed's going to drop and it'll just keep doing layers and layers of powder with the laser hitting it in between each laser. So what you don't see great in this video is where these are, um, the little imprints are happening. There's a laser above that that is causing these imprints. And then you get the new powder over it. You get another hit from the laser and you build as you go. Whereas binder jetting, the difference on this one, you'll get a layer of powder and then the machine 
puts a binding material. So think glue, it's laying down some kind of glue that is holding that powder together and then curing that instead of using a laser to do so. With the application of the loose particle material to the building platform by a recoater. Afterwards, the print head applies the binder selectively at the areas where the future part is to be produced, thus connecting the layers. After the binder has been applied, the building platform is lowered by the layer thickness. This process is repeated until the part is completely finished. The unprinted particle material is removed after the printing process. The models... So as you guys can see, it's we're always repeating layer by layer by layer. It's just a matter of how are we doing that? Are we using binding material? Are we using a laser? Are we doing resin and using a light to adhere it together? Um, the last two, so sheet lamination, it's the same thing as binder jetting, but instead of rolling out powder or loose particle, it just rolls out a whole sheet of whatever material you're utilizing. And then the last one is directed energy deposition modeling or direct metal laser sintering. So this is when we get into metal printing. So metal can either come as a powder and then a laser will hit it and bind it together or you can do metal filaments and the printer will melt that filament kind of like an FDM style. But at this point, obviously, when you're trying to melt metal, you're at a whole other melting point and whole different temperatures and all of those things. So it gets way more complicated, of course, as you go for metal. Now, metal takes a lot more work after the fact. Um, there is a sintering step involved in that, and there's typically an acid wash as well. So metal is very complicated. You won't see it in many healthcare buildings because you're really getting to a different level of manufacturing that's kind of above what a hospital is set up to accommodate at their facility. So why is all of this relevant for healthcare? Where can we use it? So PT, OT, rehab, prosthetics, orthotics. Um, we can do upper extremity orthotics. We can develop functional devices. Um, we can do check sacks check sockets for prosthetic pieces, hand pieces, custom covers, all kinds of splinting, um, assisted devices, all sorts of things. It's a huge thing in the PTOT rehab world. Biomedical engineering, facility engineering, we can print different parts. Like I talked about doing replacement parts for different pieces of equipment. Um, radiology and surgery. So anatomical models for pre-surgical planning based on imaging that's been performed. I talked about dental, I'm gonna go deep into dental in a minute. And then of course, also education. So models for patients to show them what's clinically happening or also making models for staff training to teach them you know, how to take care of patients or different things of that nature. And why would we want to do this? Well, of course, the number one thing is cost savings. So by using 3D printing and bringing services in-house, we'll, we can dramatically reduce the costs of items that are being made um, instead of having to send them out to third parties. And by bringing it in-house, you're going to decrease your turnaround time. So you can get things to patients much quicker rather than having to wait for someone else to make it and send it back to you if you're just doing it yourself. On top of that, if you're doing it yourself, you are now the owner of that digital file. So if anything ever needs to be remade, if you need to go back and tweak something in the file for the design, you have all of that yourself in-house and you don't have to work with a third party to get things handled. Um, this gives you the option to do customization for patient-specific needs. So by doing that, you're offering patients something that they can't receive anywhere else you're making it specific for their need. And then of course, we're going to increase patient satisfaction by doing all of these other things I talked about. So let's talk about dental a little bit. Um, the top left photo shows you a set of copy dentures, a um, night guard, and then a custom impression tray, all 3D printed. The top right is actually a 3D printed model with a implant tried into it. 
the bottom left, uh, this is a stack of PMMA bridges. So this top one was actually milled, meaning it was actually like CNC per se, a little drill bit was used to make that versus this middle one was made on an SLA 3D printer and this bottom one was made on a DLP 3D printer. So these were both 3D printed versus the milled one and the different 3D printing technologies, you can kind of see the difference of quality you get based on what type of printer you're using. This is actually 3D printed wax and it's used to make crowns. So they'll then pour ceramic into this wax and actually make a permanent crown out of that. This last picture is a surgical guide. So it's 3D printed surgical guide that dictates how deep the drill is gonna go into the patient's tooth based on the size of this hole. So the hole will stop the drill from going too deep. So how do we do these things? How do we make them? So this is where I was kind of talking about the specific CAD software. So these pictures are taken from uh, dental CAD software. Uh, the, a couple popular ones are Three Shape, which is what this is from, and then ExoCAD is another really popular one. Those, of course, are not free. <laughs> um, you have to buy licenses for those. Um, this shows you from how to make a custom impression tray for the design process. So the picture on the left is showing you a stone model that was scanned into the computer. Um, when you scan the model, you then in the software, create your outline as to where you want the tray to go. And you can see this pink on here is actually wax that you use to kind of mark around the tooth so that when it designs the final product, um, it's not too tight on the teeth or anything like that. So after you do your outline, do your wax buildup, um, the software is going to go ahead and automatically generate this custom tray for you. Then you'll have the option to put a handle on it if you want to. It's kind of dentist preference. Some like handles, some don't. Um, but as you can see, the software kind of walks you through step by step. Um, all you really had to do is mark where you want it to go and then it auto generates it for you. So let's see, in the dental CAD software, when you are selecting the, you'll select the printer you're gonna use based on the printer dictates the settings for the printer. So if your printer is only accurate to a hundred microns, you can only do so much, um, this is called relief. See how this is kind of bumped up off of the model. So you have to give some relief in there because they're gonna put impression material in that. So you don't want this to be super fitted to the teeth. You need room to put impression material, but based on the accuracy of your printer dictates how low you can go on the relief numbers and things of that nature. So if you have a very, very basic hobbyist style 3D printer, you're not going to be able to make as great of a product if versus if you had a more high-end um, medical type of 3D printer. So this was an example of how to design a night guard, um, but the difference on this is this is coming from a digital scan. So this would have been using an intraoral scanner first on the patient to get your digital file here. And then you can just design around the digital file instead of having to scan a stone model in. So those are a couple, couple options for how you can design. You can literally do everything digital, take it straight off of an intraoral scan, or you can scan in a model, you can scan in an impression and then build off of that as well. So some of the benefits of doing this, um, these are just some numbers that we have seen. So reducing patient wait time, typically if you have to send that out to a third party, you're gonna wait about three to four weeks for a night guard. If you're doing it in-house, I mean, you can honestly do it same day if you have the staffing to accommodate, um, or typically it's about a one week turnaround time with standard numbers of orders coming in and standard staffing. Um, but again, can totally be done same day. Uh, copy dentures, typically that's like a six week turnaround. So if a patient breaks their denture and you have to send that out to have it remade, a patient might be going without their dentures for up to six weeks versus if you're doing that in house, you can do it in three to four days. Um, you can decrease costs. Um, so this is just, uh, some differences of, Average third-party costs, this does not include insurance costs, so please don't go and compare these numbers to what you see on your insurance. I know like 
myself personally, I had to pay $350 for my night guard, my 3D printed night guard for my own private dentist, <laughs> um, because that's what my cost was through my insurance. So these don't compare these numbers to insurance, but um, as you can see, like a third party lab might charge anywhere between 100 to 190 for the, a night guard and a 3D printed one is three to $4. So it's a drastically decrease in the cost savings. And again, if you're doing this all in-house, you can have dentist direct involvement in the design for their own patients. Instead of sending it off for someone else to do, they can look at it before you ever even print it and say, yes, I'm good with that. Let's go. You also own the digital file, so you can make any changes you need to. And then you also have control of the manufacturing process, which would include your quality management for your end-use products. So you know exactly how that product is being made. So PT, OT, prosthetics, rehab, these are a couple examples of things. Um, on the left-hand side, those are tactile maps for blind rehab. So you want high contrast, which is why you have the black white. And then it's almost like we made braille on there. So you can see, um, you know, for someone who has very low vision or is partially blind, they can still utilize these to path their way through the hospital and get to where they need to go. Um, the middle one is an example of a cup holder for a wheelchair. And then on the right, you'll see the, um, a prosthetic check socket. So these are just some numbers um, for cost savings for wheelchair accessories. So you'll see the cup holder, a phone mount, um, a bunch of different joystick attachment pieces. So these vendor costs are true costs that we took directly off a quote that we had from a vendor versus the material cost for printing them. So this is a 97% cost savings when we went into the math on this. So not only is this a substantial cost savings, but these are commonly requested items. So if you're 3D printing these, you can make them in bulk and then you can just store them in your physical therapy office or wherever area you're at. So when a patient comes in, you can just give it to them right on the spot instead of having to order something. Um, I see a question in the chat, how realistic do 3D printed dentures look? Um, 3D products are not one color. I have the PolyJet printer. You can print like 50,000 different colors. It's some crazy amount of color. Um, I'm going to go back actually real quick to the dental. So this picture right here in the top left, that is a 3D printed denture. So the way this one was actually made, the teeth are printed off on one material and the gums are printed in another material and you cure them together. So then you have your denture. There are other printers out there that do them all in one. So the polyjets, like I said, can do multiple colors at one time. So you can just print them all together in one piece instead of having to bond your teeth and your gums together. But yeah, um, 3D printers can be numerous, like hundreds of colors in one print. So let me kick back forward real quick. Okay, prosthetic sockets. Um, so these are known as your temporary sockets. People call them check sockets. So the point of doing this is you'll scan your patient and then you'll make them the temporary sockets, a size on them to make sure it's going to be a good fit. So when you're sizing these, you're typically... Um, I've been in a prosthetic lab where you, you literally have a blowtorch and you're melting the plastic kind of shaping it to the patient to get exactly the shape you want. And also if you need to cut some down from the top to make sure it fits correctly. And then once you get your temporary socket, you will then take that and they'll either laminate it in carbon fiber, or there's a couple different things they can do to turn it into your permanent socket. Now, the difference of this is for your temporary socket a lot of times if you're having this outsourced to a third party, you're waiting weeks to get it back. Whereas this is 3D printed in 45 minutes on a large scale 3D printer. And that's just using FDM. So this is a very, very cheap print. Um, many hospitals don't have room to have a full prosthetics lab in their, within their hospital walls. But if you just have a 3D printer in your space, then you can make these items without having to have a full-blown lab installed. So this just shows some of the cost savings for it. So a typical one being sent out is anywhere from like 150 to 250. It depends on 
as you can see, the different add-ons that you'd put on your job versus a 3D printed one. If you're using pellets can be anywhere from three to $10 or anywhere from 15 to 25. And question in the chat, it is very widely used in dental clinics. It's actually being taught in dental school now. So it's known as digital dentistry. So if you just Google digital dentistry, there's an entire world of 3D printing and dental. So let's talk a little bit about pre-surgical planning and anatomical modeling. So how do we go about doing this? It gets very complicated for this. So anatomical models are very powerful tools for surgeons to use, not only to visualize a 3D model prior to performing a surgery, but it also allows them to practice on these models without ever opening up the patient. It's also very popular for sh showing the patient to help them understand what's actually going on with them clinically. So let's talk about how we actually do this. So for those who don't know what you're looking at on the screen, this is actually a CT. So if you have CT imaging here, you're actually using a software that is known as segmentation software. The segmentation software to do anatomical modeling has to be FDA approved. So it has to have a 510K on it. The software is intelligent enough to recognize different anatomies based on the densities of the imaging. So this is where we would be, myself as an engineer, I'd be working with a clinician or a radiologist to help me develop these types of models before I would 3D print them. So I would never be making these on my own without having clinical input. So when you're going slice by slice through this imaging, you're highlighting the different areas of interest. And while you're doing that, it's building you a model down here on the right-hand side of your screen. So this is a kidney with a tumor on it. And then this is an example of an aortic root for a TAVR case. So this is kind of what the digital imaging looks like. So once you get through your CT, you can also use an MRI. You can use a bunch of different imaging files to pull your data to build your model. Once you build your model, it kind of looks like this. So it's a little rough, but um, for those who have, don't have an understanding of how CT imaging works, Again, we're on that layer by layer thing. So in between the slices of the CT, um, it's not always very smooth. So that's why sometimes you'll get some bumpiness in your model. Um, and I'm sure as you are probably aware, our anatomy inside of us is not perfectly smooth either. So this shows the digital image. This, is, this yellow in here is the calcification on this root. And then this is what it looks like 3D printed. So you can color, um, here's an example of a multicolor. So we have some pink and white in there to show the calcification. And then this material is a soft um, squishy material. So this was done on a polyjet. So you have the soft and the hard and multicolor all combined into one print. So um, this is where it starts to get boring. So I'm gonna try to not bore everyone to death with this, but these are the regulatory considerations that are important to know about when you start talking 3D printing in the medical field. So the FDA has made it pretty clear that if a model is intended to be used for diagnostic purposes to determine the approach of a surgery, that is considered a class two medical device. If the model is only being used for training or general education or patient communication, it is not a medical device. So this is where you have to get, you need to understand your regulations because you need to know if you're actually manufacturing medical devices or not. Because if you are, if you get into medical device manufacturing, it's a whole other world that I'm going to get into in a second. So Given the FDA regulatory standards on medical modeling, there is options that need to be considered before moving into producing these. So first off, I, I talked about software. Your software has to be FDA approved. So some popular ones are materialized mimics. Um, there's 3D systems D2P, which is known as DICOM to print. That's what it stands for. Um, there's one called Simpleware Scan IP which is the newest one to obtain the FDA clearance out there. So each software is cleared with the FDA utilizing a specific printer with specific materials for specific applications. So for example, 
3D Systems D2P is only cleared to be used on four different 3D system brand printers with five of their material options. And they're only cleared for cardiovascular, craniofacial, gastrointestinal, musculoskeletal, and neurological applications. So bottom line of all that means if you don't own a 3D Systems printer and you're not using those materials or making one of those types of cases I just talked about, you're not cleared to make those parts, if that all makes sense. So there are options for getting new clearances. Of course, hospitals can always say, you know, if they have a product and they're like, I've been making this for, you know, like a vasculature model and it's, it's not clear, but that's what I want to do it for. You can always apply for your own 510K. Of course, um, that's very time consuming. You can leverage what other companies have done and use that as a predicate to then file a 510k. Um, but the best thing to do is follow what has already been cleared along the way. The last option to be considered, and this is where it gets kind of into a gray area and there's not a ton of very good regulation out there on this, but it's considered following the practice of medicine. So a clinician can 3D print a model not currently covered by an already cleared process if they deem it necessary for providing the best care for their patient, if they have a direct patient-clinician relationship, meaning that you're not producing a model for a patient that is being treated by a different clinician, it has to be your exact patient, and also, the caring clinician has to be directly involved in the creation of the model. So that would be considered scope of practice, practice of medicine. There are regulations in regards to addressing individual patient-specific needs. Um, I'm watching the time, so I'm not going to dive too deep into this, but these are some different options with the FDA in regards to how do I make something very unique that is a medical device for a very specific use case for an individual patient. Um, you can do humanitarian use device. Um, there's device exemption pathways, emergency use, um, compassionate use. These are all different topics of how to get something approved pretty quickly for one individual patient. Um, I'm not going to talk about this. Just know that the Code of Federal Regulations, Title 21, is what dictates medical device manufacturing. So the difficult thing in the healthcare field is clinicians are not trained on 21 CFR, specifically Section 820 is what gets really deep into the regulations. So what we run into a lot is in the healthcare field is people don't know these regulations exist out there. So you think you can just buy a printer and make whatever you want, but that's totally not the case. So it's very important to understand what the regulations are before you start producing things for patients. Um, so this is uh, kind of just a slide of things to have understanding on. Again, since I'm watching time, I'm not gonna go very deep into this, but you need to know what the 510k clearances are on certain products codes versus the materials that you're using. So where it gets complicated in dental um, and how some of these things are advertised. So let's say one dentist calls a night guard, a mouth guard, someone calls it an occlusal guard, someone might call it a splint. So they all kind of mean the same thing. But really, a night guard is typically used for bruxism, which is, means you grind your teeth. So if you're actually producing the product code uh, item for bruxism, then only certain materials are cleared for that. But if you're making just a splint, which means the splint just holds the teeth in place, it's not actually doing anything for grinding, that's a different product code with a different 510K clearance. So you have to be very specific on what the product is actually being used for to know where to look for the right clearance. Um, and then there are also things that 
maybe when you look them up, they might say they're 510K exempt, but they still require GMP, which is good manufacturing practice. So I could give you an entire presentation that's probably, I probably need three hours to explain GMP to you guys. So GMP gets really deep into quality management. So if you're doing good manufacturing product, good manufacturing practice, you have an entire quality management system in place, which basically means you document everything humanly possible. You follow all the regulations, you know every detail about labeling, about recalling products that you made. Um, you have to have a complaint system in place. It's very complicated and it takes a lot of people to build it. So it's not something you can just magically have overnight. You can't just say, oh, I have a quality system in place. I, you know, I, I document everything. <laughs> it's so much more than that. Um, and so the important thing um, is sometimes it's not always great to listen to the sales rep. I know um, I have some great sales reps and they're wonderful people. And I don't want this to sound like I'm knocking on them, but sometimes when you're listening to the sales rep, I'm going to go back to my dental example. They might say, oh yeah, you can make, um, you know, night guards on this because they're calling a night guard the same thing as a splint, but really they don't know that you can't actually make a night guard for bruxism. You can only make a splint. So unfortunately the salespeople will sometimes make it confusing because they are selling you something and you're looking at all the advertisements from the company and you're like, oh, look, I can make dental products on that printer. But you really have to have an understanding of the regulation behind it and you need to know where to go. Another thing that gets complicated is um, the manufacturers of the resin specifically is what I'm going to talk about. Um, so let's say you have a Formlabs printer with Formlabs resin. Well, they might not be the actual manufacturer of the resin inside that bottle. So even though it's labeled and says Form Labs, they may have not made that resin. So the 510K clearance is actually listed on the manufacturer of the resin itself, not the reseller of the resin to make things even more complicated for everyone to understand. <laughs> so of course, you also need to ask for biocompatibility reports. So you need to know that testing was actually completed on that resin to know that it's safe. So, and that goes back to you need to get it from the actual manufacturer of the resin, not the reseller of the resin. So to close things out, um, I'm going to end on a video for you guys. So this is actually a video that aired on the Today Show. Um, talks about how 3D printing improved the, a patient's quality of life. So this is the Geoscent. It was an ear scent that was 3D printed. And I'm gonna let the story speak for itself. I love this video because it really focuses on the patient instead of the actual like manufacturing of the product. So I am going to click over here real quick and let this play for you guys. I was watching TV and my wife would set the volume for about 20, you know how that works. And I would set the volume for 45, you know? And I said, I have an ear problem. When 76-year-old retired Army Specialist Michael Nicoletti noticed something was off with his hearing, the former engineer in him didn't waste any time coming up with a solution. What made you think, ah, a straw could work? Walking into the kitchen and I saw this, we have a stack of straws. And I said, you know, what would happen if I cut one of those straws off? And so I did, and I stuck them in my ears. And then I went in and I said, all right, turn the TV on. And lo and behold, you know, a, a setting of 20 or 25 was good for me now. In need of a more permanent fix, the Vietnam vet was referred to audiologist Dr. Kit Flanagan at the Ralph H. Johnson VA Medical Center in Charleston, South Carolina. So Dr. Flanagan, this, uh, this man comes into your office and he tells you, I've been putting straws in my ears, doc. What would what, you say? A little alarming. Um, I said we probably shouldn't be doing that. We can probably find an alternative uh, that can help you out. Dr. Flanagan diagnosed Nicoletti with acquired atresia, his hearing loss due to his ear canals collapsing. Most people with the condition have it in just one ear, but Mr. Nicoletti has it in both. If you've ever worn earplugs, you've, yeah. you've experienced what Mr. Nicoletti experiences on a daily basis. 
since Nicoletti didn't want to have surgery, he and Dr. Flanagan decided to come up with a device of their own that would help in the same way the drinking straws did, by propping open his ear canal, but a bit more sophisticated. So Dr. Flanagan reached out to biomedical engineer Nikki Beitenman, who runs the Charleston VA's 3D printing lab, and asked her to make stents for Mr. Nicoletti's ears. The lab uses the technology to print a variety of things from organ replicas to cup holders for veterans' wheelchairs. We use a 3D CAD software to draw from scratch. So basically what that means is we're literally drawing on the computer in 3D shapes. And then the printer just does layer by layer and forms the shape that you upload to it. The lab went through six different prototypes before coming up with the right fit. We were able to rely on Mr. Nic Nicoletti's feedback to say, hey, let's, let's, let's try this. Let's make it softer. Let's make it smoother. The stents have been a game changer for Mr. Nicoletti and meant no more debates over the TV volume. After using the straws, I was down in the 25 range. And now with these, I'm still down in that t about 25, OK? I'm a happy camper. And within just a few months, the ear stint was granted the VA's first ever compassionate use approval for a 3D printed medical device by the FDA. You mentioned that people don't often think about the VA as a hotbed of innovation, and I'd love to change that idea. Um, conservatively, there's over a million veterans in our country with hearing loss. So if we can change one veteran's mind to, to come to the VA, and use us for their health care, I think that's a victory also. Were you okay with being the guinea pig? Absolutely. I'm, I'm a veteran. I, I fought in Vietnam, and I have many of my brothers are here. If it helps one of them to, with a hearing, a similar hearing issue, you know, then I think it's well, it's well worth the effort. Mike, you're the only guy uh, in America with, with these devices. And, and, and there is no pressure here. I just want everybody to know uh, they're, they're called the Geo Ear Canal Stints. I heard they let you name them. Giovanni is the name of my new grandson, Giovanni Anthony Nicoletti. The Geo Stint. Yeah, Geo Stint. That's yeah. great. All right, so that is where I'm going to end it for today. So I hope I was able to kind of show you guys how you can take 3D printing and apply this into the healthcare field. Um, I went all the way to the very end. So I tried to answer, I think I got all the questions that were in the chat. If there's any more questions, um, feel free to email me or Deanne and we can get those answered for you guys. If anyone has any questions now, I will gladly stay on and answer a couple. Thank you, Nikki. Um, yeah, we'll be on here for a little bit and we'll have a recording posted and emailed to you all next week. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the network of the National Library of Medicine. Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.